Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we are now very appropriately uh, concluding our program for today um, with reflections from Senator Slade Gorton. Um, Senator Gorton has been in the trenches of foreign policy making in the Senate and is going to share with us some of his reflections from his experience there and observations of uh, what we see ahead um, in terms of the Senate's role in foreign policy, particularly um, in the context of the strategic rebalancing towards Asia. Uh, Senator Gorton has been a leader in Washington State and a public servant um, for over six decades. He served in the Senate for three terms. Um, he also served in the Washington State House and as Washington State's Attorney General, among many other accomplishments. Um, he was the first permanent member of the 9-11 Commission and has remained very committed and active on national security issues. Uh, additionally, I want to mention um, that Senator Gorton is the counselor in residence at MBR, and in his honor, we launched the Slade Gorton International Policy Center in 2010 to serve as a focal point in Washington State for world class policy oriented discussion, research, and to inspire the next generation of leaders, particularly in the public sector. So it's a real treat to have Senator Gorton here with us today. Um, and I'm going to immediately turn the floor over to him for his remarks. In spite of that uh, marvelous introduction, I'm going to start with the proposition that the true reflection of the importance of foreign policy to members of the United States Senate is reflected in the membership of the Foreign Relations Committee itself. And on that basis, uh, that assignment ranks in the bottom half of choices of committee assignments at, uh, in, in the Senate. This obviously was not uh, always the case by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the Foreign Relations Committee was uh, uh, vital uh, in the transition from World War II to the Cold War and through the Cold War. And many of the most noted members of the United States Senate uh, were a part of it. Among Republicans, uh, at least, four committees were considered uh, what we called double A, finance, appropriations, Armed services uh, and, uh, and 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 foreign relations, and what double A meant was that you could only be a member of one of those committees, and almost from the beginning of a Senate career, uh, you aimed at a given direction. That situation disappeared, you know, more than a decade ago, when the Foreign Relations Committee simply couldn't fill its membership. Uh, in, that, in that fashion. But almost no one chose that uh, as an assignment as against uh, one, of the other, you know, one of the other three. And as a consequence, at the present time, uh, the membership of the, the, membership of the uh, committee itself is among Republicans all first-term members, including the, the ranking minority member, all first-term members, and only John McCain is a senior member of the United States and a, a Senate and a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. And for John McCain, very bluntly, it is less important to him than his membership on the Armed Services Committee and on the Committee, uh, on the committee of, uh, of Commerce. Why is that? And uh, as a personal reflection, I majored in international relations at college, but it never crossed my mind to join the Foreign Relations Committee in the United States Senate. And we just saw last year in both the Senate and the House the defeat of the former chairman and a very, very important uh, House member uh, uh, from those committees by their electorate. Now. Senator Luger did not lose his position in the United States Senate, in my opinion, because people disagreed with his position on foreign policy by any stretch of the imagination, even in a Midwest state like Indiana. He probably lost it, at least in part, because people felt that his emphasis on that subject uh, showed an indifference uh, to their daily lives. 
and the elements of the federal Congress that, uh, that you know that affected uh, you know, uh, those lives, and that that's one of the reasons I think that at the present time we have a first-term member uh, taking over you know, his position on the committee itself. My my own analysis or reflection on that is that the Foreign Relations Committee is of importance uh, in in the the Senate and probably to a certain extent in the House as well, in direct proportion to the belief in the United States that our future is threatened by reason of, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of foreign policy or foreign uh, uh, you know, aggression. Obviously, during World War II, you know, that was the case. Obviously, in the transition, say, between 1945 and 1950, the uh, end of the Cold War, uh, that was overwhelmingly uh, you know, uh, the case. But that importance and that feeling of threat declined as the United States felt more and more secure in that respect. And we have a situation, we had a situation for many of those years uh, <clears throat> in which the ventures into significant foreign policy on the part of both houses of Congress were episodic. And in fact, the views of, of both houses of Congress in a wide range of uh, events short of war always seem to have, made, to have been during my 18 years more hawkish than that of the administration. Clearly, with respect to Israel, Congress is is uh, much more adamant in its support of Israel than any president, with the possible exception of the second Bush, uh, have been in the last 50 or 60 years. And the same thing holds true elsewhere. Both houses of Congress quite frequently pass sense of the Senate or sense of the House or sense of uh, Congress uh, uh, resolutions uh, that are tougher and less nuanced than the views of uh, the administration itself, or for that matter, than the views of the two committees that deal uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with foreign policy. Uh, those committees tend to be softer uh, on, foreign, uh, on, on foreign relations challenges uh, than is the Congress as a whole, and much more in accord with the president, uh, with presidents of, uh, e uh, of either parties. I, I can illustrate this to a certain extent from uh, my, my, uh, my, my own experience. I had in 18 years only two times, only two occasions, you know, on which I dealt with foreign policy in any significant uh, you know, way at all. Uh, the first was after Tiananmen Square. Uh, I had a legislative assistant at that time, a Chinese-American uh, fluent uh, in Mandarin uh, and having had considerable experience in China, who knew a significant number of the young students who were demonstrating in Tiananmen Square stayed in the office for 48 or 72 hours at a time, very often in, uh, you know, in telephone conversation with people who were part of those demonstrations. Largely as a result of that, uh, you know, with his help, uh, I became the primary sponsor and supporter of the act that allowed the Chinese students and others to stay in, in here you know, in the United States. Uh, which took some time to pass, but probably ended up by being uh, one of the greatest pluses for our society and one of the greatest minuses uh, for the People's Republic of China uh, of uh, anything that we had ever done. But in connection with that bill, I had no help from the administration at all. This was, you know, this, this happened uh, basically because almost by accident, one member of Congress really cared very deeply about it and touched uh, the views of many others. The second results from the fact that while I served in the Senate for uh, 18 years, they weren't consecutive. Uh, I won a term in the Senate, I lost after six years, won the other Senate two years there, uh, thereafter. In that interim two-year period while I was practicing law in, uh, in, in Seattle, uh, I had a, a longtime friend who was an Estonian emigre uh, who had escaped from Estonia at the end of uh, World War II. 
And whoever year or so would come in and talk to me about the Baltics and about the fact that they ought to be independent. And, and I was moderately patient with them, but that's about all I can say. But when I was reelected in, uh, in uh, returned to the Senate in 1998, uh, Vilo was the last individual whom I saw before I came back to Washington, D.C. And his parting words were, Slade, remember the Baltics? To which my answer was, sure, Vilo. Uh, <laughs> basically, without you know, any, any view that anything would ever, would ever happen. It was just a couple of years thereafter, of course, that the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, you know, the Estonians elected an illegal Congress to declare their independence, and because of this individual, I was invited to be its keynote speaker. I can say that in 18 years in the Senate, I never worked more carefully on a speech you know, than I did on what I was going to say to those people you know, attempting to revise uh, their nation. But about a week uh, before I was due to speak, it became quite evident that I was not going to be allowed to go to Tallinn, that uh, the Soviet Union would not grant me a visa you know, for that purpose uh, at all. And so ultimately, I gave the speech on the floor of the Senate, where of course it was uh, you know, taped and recorded. Uh, we sent the tape to Tallinn, uh, 800 people in this hall had a seat with a bouquet on it and my name on it in front, and uh, and they, they played the videotape, which got more publicity than it would have had I been there you know, you know, on my own. Uh, so I had some modest role in the liberation of the Republic of Estonia. What brings these two incidents together was that they didn't, either of them, really have any uh, you know, relationship to what was happening in the Senate, uh, uh, to, to what was going on in the, in, in, in the Foreign Relations Committee at all. They happened in each case almost by, you know, by accident. And I strongly suspect that that's the case uh, with a majority of other members of the United States Senate and many members of the House of Representatives it, itself. Members of the two houses of Congress can have an impact on foreign affairs, it seems to me, almost only if they become real experts on a particular nation or a particular part of the world and become sophisticated enough and knowledgeable enough about them uh, so that they can influence others, including people in the Foreign Service and in, in the State Department uh, you know, itself. Under those circumstances, they can have some impact. But in the absence of an overwhelming threat to the United States, foreign policy is going to be conducted by the executive. Uh, and it is. Uh, you know, whether the president's a Republican or a Democrat, a liberal or a conservative, uh, the, the, uh, the, the power and the single focus of the White House and of the Department of State uh, that, uh, that, that works for the president uh, is going to overwhelm any contribution that uh, Congress uh, is able uh, to, uh, to apply to it. It's maybe only in the last two or three weeks that we might be able to consider that we are again under threat from North, uh, North Korea, uh, though we really don't believe it at this point. Uh, but uh, this point is not the only point uh, on, on that spectrum itself. And I would expect to exactly the extent that that threat should become real, that the influence of the Senate particularly and of the House of Representatives may once again grow. Uh, the president, of course, is always better off uh, if he has the support <coughs> of the Congress, especially you know, when there's any kind of armed conflict that, you know, around. And again, my observation from my 18 years is that approval can be pretty easy to get it at the beginning and pretty difficult to maintain uh, over any, uh, you know, yeah, 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 any extended period of time. So <coughs> when NBR or any other group deals with foreign policy, it deals to a very, very large extent uh, with the President, with the State Department, uh, with the Agency for International Development, and deals with members of Congress only to be able to get op-eds written. 
uh, uh, you know, with some kind of signature you know, behind them. But that doesn't mean that that work isn't uh, important. It obviously is. Uh, I, I think MBR is one of the great valuable institutions that uh, the people of the United States are, are, are privileged to, to, to have with it. But it's also very important to keep one's eyes on the ball and to figure out how you influence the administration to a far greater extent than how you influence Congress. Thank you, Senator Gordon, for sharing your insights with us. And I found it this morning, Congressman Larson said that, you know, people often talk about the need to understand Congress, but really you need to understand members of Congress, individual members. And yeah. I think both yes. of your Great. stories mm -hmm. really illustrate that point quite beautifully um, in terms of both uh, Tiananmen and also Estonia. So thank you so much for wrapping up our program on such a substantive and insightful note. Um, please join me in thanking Senator Gorton, and thank you all again for coming. <laughs>